Welcome to the webinar, Clinical and Cost Considerations for Value-Based Multiple Sclerosis Care. This program is jointly provided by North American Center for Continuing Med Medical Education and Horizon CME. This webinar is supported by educational grants from Biogen and Sanofi Genzyme. I'm Dr. Eric Cannon with Select Health in Murray, Utah. Also presenting with me is Dr. Clyde Markowitz from the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, and we will be your presenters today. On this slide, you can see our disclosures. On this slide, we have our learning objectives, and today I think what we'd like to do is talk about the downstream clinical and economic consequences of either suboptimal or delayed treatment of multiple sclerosis. We want to distinguish among uh, many of the new and emerging disease-modifying therapies that are on the market or coming out, uh, talk about their mechanisms of action, their efficacy, safety, and administration. Uh, we want to outline some of the key considerations uh, for starting, changing, and stopping therapy. And then we want to be able to integrate the risks, benefits, and current recommended therapeutic placement of MS therapies into some informed decisions that are made by the health plans that will facilitate optimal treatment uh, for our patients. So let's, let's take a look at, at multiple sclerosis. Uh, MS is, is a disease state that requires a lifelong and dynamic treatment, and it places a substantial burden on, on the individual's and, and even society today. Uh, what we're seeing, and I think what we're seeing from employers and others in the market, is we're seeing costs that are escalating, and they're escalating rapidly. So as we work through these, I think payers are going to require some kind of population-based solutions. We need guidelines, and we need some treatment algorithms for how we best manage multiple sclerosis. And we need to find a way that we can actually incorporate many of those things into the decision-making process as we establish our formularies. Approximately 400,000 patients have multiple sclerosis in the United States, uh, and, and it was interesting to me that the total lifetime cost per patient is estimated at about $4.1 million. Uh, we can see that as the disease burden increases, as does the disability, so do the costs. Uh, if we were to look at disease-modifying therapies on their own, they account for about 69% of total costs. So if we were to look at what we have available, in the disease-modifying therapy class, we've got numerous agents available. They have varying mechanisms of actions, formulations, and different routes of administration. You go back several years ago, and we really only had an injectable option. We now have also injections, oral options, and, and things that can be infused. We have differences between the products as far as efficacy, tolerability, and, and even adverse events. So as we're going through this today, and I think as we listen to Dr. Markowitz talk, It'll be interesting to learn how do we individualize treatment, how do we take into account patient preferences, how do we pick what's going to be best for that patient, but then how do we also minimize the burden that exists today uh, for payers and others in the market. As with many disease states, I think what we're starting to learn is that early treatment may slow the natural course of multiple sclerosis. And what we're finding and what the data would show is that it is cost effective. And, and so, we can and should be using disease-modifying therapies earlier in the treatment course of our patients. Let's talk a little bit about the dimensions of formulary. Uh, today, many of our, our formularies are driven by class. They're driven by tiered copays. And on this slide, we've got generic, preferred, non-preferred, but we also know that most of the therapies that we'll be talking today fall into some kind of specialty category. Uh, they're high cost, and many times we manage those by indication. If we look at where we need to go in the future, coming up with value-based insurance designs will be critical. Uh, we want to pay for what works. How do we integrate that into accountable care organizations? How do we integrate that into medical homes? We also want to make sure that as we develop a formulary, we're developing something that can be personalized for the individual. How do we incorporate targeted therapies? And, and if appropriate, where do companion diagnostics fall in that mix? So what are some of the formulary challenges? One of the things that we find in our business is we want to maintain consistency for the physicians that participate with us, but we have regulatory inconsistencies that exist between Medicare and Medicaid and, and the qualified health plans that we sell on the commercial exchanges. How do we account for those regular regulatory inconsistencies? Right now, disease-modifying therapies account for about 95% of the total annual pharmacy cost per patient when we start looking at multiple sclerosis and they, they account for 
of the total cost in managing these patients. At this point, I'd like to turn the time over to Dr. Markowitz for a clinical presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cannon. I will now discuss the treatment and how we think about management of patients with multiple sclerosis. So our general principles for the treatment of MS is really to make a diagnosis as early as possible and to treat as early as possible. And we think of it as, you know, when somebody presents with their first event, clinically isolated syndrome stage, we want to get them on treatment as early as possible, mainly because we've learned from all the clinical trials we've done to date that delays in treatment can lead to progression of the disease, and ultimately you cannot get that back. And you know that the inflammatory process that's occurring in MS is ongoing, and it's causing damage within the brain and central nervous system, so we want to prevent that by starting treatment as early as possible. And when we think about which treatment and how we're going to manage somebody, we have to take into account a number of um, pieces of information. For one, we look at their disease activity. And that may look like, you know, what kind of MRI activity they, they have on their um, initial imaging, what their clinical presentation was, and kind of a little bit about their demographics. And we can make some sort of prognostic assessment of what we believe this patient's going to uh, look like over the next, you know, 20 to 30 years of their life. And really, if we see something that's worrisome to, that, to us, we make these uh, decisions to start them on a more aggressive therapy up front. And I'll talk a little about that in a minute. And the key here is following, following these patients closely, managing them on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, really assessing their symptomatology, reevaluating them with MRI scans periodically. And if there's evidence for disease activity or we feel that the medication has been inadequate, to, you know, don't be afraid to switch them to an alternative therapy. So the current landscape for the treatment of multiple sclerosis currently has 18 treatments available, 10 different mechanisms of action. And I should tell you in advance that there are several other compounds that are currently uh, being investigated and some which are at the FDA that may get approval in the next year or two. And all of them are approved for the relapsing form of MS. So far, we only have one drug that's approved for primary progressive MS. And then we divide them into injectable therapies, oral therapies, and monoclonal infusible therapies. The key to this is, you know, initiating them and making the specific recommendations about what we believe these drugs are going to be able to do. And based on the clinical trials, we know they reduce the likelihood of clinical attacks, they slow the disability progression as measured by the neurologic exam, and they all have been shown to have benefits with regard to reducing MRI activity, both active and new uh, lesions seen on MRI. And we have to factor in both what we believe is the appropriate therapy for a patient, but also take into consideration what the patient's concerns may be. Maybe their lifestyle issues, maybe their risk, you know, with different medications and concerns for, you know, potential side effects. So we use their concerns and we have our own opinion about what we believe is the best therapy, and we make a shared decision so that patients feel like they're involved in the decision-making process, because ultimately, if we put them on a therapy that they don't feel comfortable with, they're not going to adhere to it. So on a prognostic standpoint, we can make a determination about when somebody presents to us initially, what the concerns might be. And we can take into consideration things such as their race. African-Americans don't do as well as Caucasians. Their age of onset, the older they are, may not do as well as if they're much younger in age. Gender, males don't seem to do as well as females. And what they present with, you know, if they present with a progressive phenotype, usually is not going to be as good as if they present with a relapsing phenotype. What part of the central nervous system is involved? Is it going to be, you know, a motor or sensory or a cerebellar or spinal cord? We know that if they present with motor, cerebellar, or spinal cord onset, they don't do as well as if they had a sensory, like an optic neuritis or a little bit of a, you know, mild sensory complaint. And other things that we worry about are how did they recover from their initial attack? If they have, you know, complete recovery, that's going to be a little bit better than if they are left with residual deficits. And when we look at the MRIs, we can actually make determinations fairly accurately about how this disease has gone subclinically. And if we see a lot of lesions on their MRI scan initially, we know that this is going to be a poor outcome. If they have a lot of GAD enhancement on their scans initially, it's going to be a poor outcome. So these are the kind of things we can make determinations up front to be able to really guide our decision-making about who needs to be on a stronger therapy that may carry a different risk profile versus somebody who might be able to be on something a little bit milder with a safer 
profile. So when we're initiating the treatment, we have to take into consideration a variety of things. And we look at the patient as an individual and we factor in things such as, you know, which medication from an efficacy standpoint, what are the concerns tolerability wise, lifestyle issues related to things such as pregnancy, are we going to be able to get the medication approved through the patient's insurance? And, you know, what is the patient's perception of their risk? for a different treatment. Some patients come into the office with a very clear agenda. They say, I want the most effective therapy. I'm willing to take some risk. And some patients say, there's no way I want to take any risks. So we have to factor that in. And then when you ultimately make the decision and the patient feels like they own some of that decision-making, how are you going to monitor them? And that's a very important piece when we talk about educating patients. They have to understand what the benefit of the treatment is, what to expect. And you know, sometimes we know that patients feel like, oh, I had an attack and I have these symptoms, and at the end of the day, you put them on one of these treatments, their perception is that those symptoms are going to go away, and that isn't necessarily the case. These treatments that we're using these days are treatments that are designed primarily as prophylactic treatments, prevention of additional symptomatology, prevention of attacks, prevention of new lesions, and slowing the rate of progression. So they need to understand that. So it's key to be able to educate them about what to expect and how we're going to monitor them. You know, what are the you know, safety monitoring plans that we're going to put in place, what blood tests they're going to need to have at whatever frequency, and how we're going to be monitoring the disease overall. Now, the rationale for early effective therapy has really come out of all the clinical trials that we've done over the last 20 years. We know that as the immune system gets revved up and there's inflammation in the brain, you can get a little bit more what we call antigenic spread. And that's a function where, you know, patients immune system will recognize a particular antigen and they move all those immune cells in there. But as the tissue gets broken up and destroyed to some degree, new antigens get exposed that maybe the immune system didn't previously have exposure to. And now you have primed up immune cells that are recognizing that as well. So now you have a little bit broader immune response going forward. So the key is trying to prevent that from happening. And you do that by starting as early as possible. You also know that if you get damage, it's irreversible for the most part. We don't really see the ability of the brain to repair itself. It tries to remyelinate to some degree, but it's fairly ineffective in doing so. So our best strategy at this point is really looking at prevention. And if you look at all the clinical trials that were done in the relapsing form of MS, they had some modest benefits. And if you went back and looked at the trials that we did in first attack or CIS patients, the, re the results were more robust there was a much greater effect on the likelihood of preventing attacks. And then if you look at the patients who were in secondary progressive disease later in the course, the benefits really were not able to be seen very well. And that's why we have no approved treatments for secondary progressive MS to date. So the key here is being able to recognize the disease early before damage has occurred in any large degree and prevention of subsequent events. So right now we have Many compounds, and our you know, first drug available was back in 1993. Uh, but as you can see on this timeline, you know, there's been tremendous progress in the field of MS. And we have a number of agents that are currently waiting for an approval in the next year or two as well. So it's been a tremendous you know, benefit that we have these therapies. They have different mechanisms of action. And I'm going to go through some of these now to kind of give you a sense about you know, what are the drugs, how they, make, what the, how they work, and what is the... Um, potential side effects or concerns. So let's start with the first generation injectable therapies. We have interferons as a class, and we have glutarum or acetate as a non-interferon. And in terms of how they work, I'm not going to go into major detail, but just to let you know that these are immune modulatory drugs. They do not cause immune suppression, so you don't see patients at increased risk for infections or cancers, but they are immune modulators. They, they modulate immune responses and they reduce the trafficking of immune cells into the central nervous system. So that's been kind of our understanding of how these drugs seem to work. Now, they come in several different flavors. We have interferons that come in both subcutaneous intramuscular preparations. We have glutamor acetate, which comes in subcutaneous administration. And that one uh, used to come in uh, once daily and then three times a week. And now we even have generics for that as well. And Bottom line, overall, they reduce the relapse rate by about 30% more or less, reducing disability progression by a similar amount. And in terms of their effect on MRI scan, somewhere between 
uh, 50 and 70% reduction of new lesions on MRI scan. Now, what we've learned over the last two decades using these medications is they're very safe. They have minimal concern for any safety issues. And in the long run, you know, we think that these could probably be used prior to pregnancy without any concern. And in some settings, we might even consider using it during the pregnancy in certain select patients where we felt that they needed to be controlled despite pregnancy being a fairly lower time for attacks. Now, we've also been concerned that maybe there was some advantage of the interferons over the glutamic acetate or vice versa. So we've done some head-to-head -head clinical trials and really have not demonstrated any significant difference between the two groups. So we believe that the treatment with these injectable therapies is fairly you know, uh, similar across the different types. Um, there may be some dosage issues with interferon as groups, but overall we'd say fairly modest benefits and no real major advantages of one over the other. We've also looked at combining these drugs, the interferons with glutamic acetate, and we really haven't seen a real added benefit to doing that either. So that's what I'm just gonna uh, finish up with for the injectable therapies. So let's move on to the, one of the first oral therapies. So fingolimod got approved in 2010, and that's a once-a-day treatment. And how this drug works, there is a sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor, and it's present in most of the tissues of your body. And there are many different receptors. We call them 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And this medication binds to the most part most of those receptors. Now, the thought there is that this receptor, when it gets bound by this medication, gets internalized, and it's no longer expressed on the surface of the cell. And that is probably how this drug works in terms of its benefit in MS. So this receptor is present on immune cells and is required for lymphocytes to migrate out of lymph nodes. So you're kind of, in essence, preventing the immune cells from gaining access into the blood and thereby gaining access into the central nervous system. But the function of the immune cells can still occur within the lymph nodes, but there are going to be much lower rate of these cells in the blood. Now, we did the clinical trials, and we did this as a a group of patients treated as comparison with placebo, and there's also a clinical trial called the TRANSFORM study looking at it compared to interferon once, once weekly um, dosing. And it showed a more robust effect, about a 50% reduction in clinical attack rate reduction. It also showed a nice effect on MRI, somewhere in the 70% to 80% range in reducing uh, clinical attacks and MRI activity. So from our standpoint, we were very pleased to see that we have now something that's a little bit more effective than the injectable therapies. But that being said, it did come at some costs from the standpoint of safety. And when you look at the safety for fingolimod, the main issues have been primarily cardiovascular. So because these receptors are present in most tissues of the body, they do have a variety of side effect issues to be somewhat concerned about and therefore need to be monitored. The first is that the cardiovascular issue is that it can cause first dose bradycardia. So the recommendation is that a patient be monitored for six hours from their first dose. An EKG needs to be done at the beginning and at the end of the six hours, and they need to have blood pressure and pulse monitored every hour. And there's certain medications that could contribute to this that can prolong the QT. So these are medications both for cardiac uh, or for depression or things like that. They need to be monitored. And you may need to consider whether it's appropriate to put a patient on this treatment depending upon what their comorbidities are. But by and large, it's a very low risk, and most patients do extremely well. Other things to need to be monitored include for macular edema. So you see this in primarily patients who have uh, an increased risk, such as diabetics or patients who have a history of uveitis. So it's recommended that patients get a first um, assessment prior to starting the treatment to make sure they don't have macular edema. And then three or four months on treatment, they should get a follow-up by evaluation, and then about once a year. And in my practice, anybody who presents to me on this medication with a new vision complaint should be evaluated because it could be an optic neuritis or it could be that it's macular edema. So it needs to be evaluated by an ophthalmologist. Other things include um, monitoring their liver function tests. It can cause some hepatotoxicity, so you just need to monitor that on a uh, fairly regular basis. Infection risk is another one. So we saw in the clinical trials that patients may have an increased risk for herpetic infections. So prior to starting treatment, they have to have adequate immunity to varicella. 
So if they've had a history of chicken pox, it just needs to be evaluated. And if they have not had chicken pox or they have no immunity, you will need to revaccinate them prior to starting treatment. In addition, there have been now 20 cases of PML and about 30 cases of cryptococcal infections with this medication. This is still very rare in the big picture of things where you know, almost 200,000 people have been treated with this medication, so the numbers are very low, but it is something patients need to be counseled about. Other things, most recently we've uh, learned that stopping the medication can cause rebound-like uh, disease activity. So we see this mostly in patients who are going to maybe become pregnant who want to come off the medication. So that's going to be a group of people you'll need to monitor closely and maybe even consider putting them on one of the injectable therapies, potentially, if they're planning a pregnancy, if they've been on this medication. Or if you're concerned that they may develop rebound-like activity, you should probably get them on another medication sooner than later. All right, so let's move on to another oral agent, terraflutamide, um, which is currently administered mostly in the U.S. as a 14 milligram dose once daily. And it's very similar to a metabolite of leflunamide, which has been used to treat rheumatoid arthritis for many years. And the benefit really has been uh, seen pretty similar in effects to what you see with the injectable therapies, but there are always these differences in clinical trial enrollment, so you can't make these cross-trial comparisons. But for the most part, it's pretty well tolerated. Exactly how the drug works is not completely clear. It does inhibit a enzyme called the dihydroorotase dehydrogenase enzyme, which is seen in your mitochondria. And it is involved with the permanent synthesis pathway and it has selective cytostatic effects on rapidly dividing cells, including proliferating lymphocytes. And that's probably how the drug works. It's cytostatic. It's not going to deplete the cells, but it has a benefit in keeping them quiet, so to speak. And there have been several clinical trials, uh, the TEMSO trial and the TOWER trial, both looking at um, relapsing admitting patients, showed benefits in the 30% range for reducing clinical attack rate. Uh, MRI activity was seen probably in the 60 to 70% range uh, for new MRI activity. And both of the clinical trials showed a reduction in uh, disability progression of about 30% as well. From a safety standpoint, it's fairly safe. No major uh, signals that came out, but there's a little bit of GI issues, nausea, maybe a little bit of diarrhea. It's fairly mild. Alopecia was seen, which is somewhat transient. The hepatotoxicity, you need to monitor liver uh, tests, which are done primarily uh, for the first six months every month, but really is not a major concern for most of us. The biggest concern with this medication was the idea that it could have some teratogenic effects seen mostly in animals. Um, we don't really see that so much, but what we've learned about this particular medication is that you can wash the drug out by giving a 10-day course of cholesteramine or activated charcoal. And so if somebody's either going to get pregnant and they want to come off this medication, and since it lives in the body for a long period of time, it's best to go ahead and wash it out. That's a 10-day course. Alternatively, somebody is on the medication and they get pregnant, you can go ahead and wash it out as well. We don't think it's a huge issue um, in terms of that 10-day regimen, but something you need to be uh, counseling your patients about and be able to, they need to understand that it's more beneficial to do a planned pregnancy in that setting. Additional concerns include um, reactivation of tuberculosis, so patients need to be screened for TB, and we usually do that with a quantiferon gold test. But for the most part, uh, if your patient really has not had any exposure to TB, that is really not a huge issue. So we'll move on to the third oral agent that we have in the treatment of multiple sclerosis, and that is dimethyl fumarate, which is administered as a twice-a-day regimen. And exactly how that drug works is not completely clear, uh, but what's interesting about it is that there are a variety of um, mechanisms by which this drug can have immune modulatory effects. There's a NRF2 pathway uh, that is probably how this medication works, and there's the NF-kappa B uh, pathway. These are all cellular pathways within cells that ultimately lead to a variety of cytokine issues, adhesion molecule issues um, that probably drive how the medication works in the treatment of MS. From an efficacy standpoint, they've done several clinical trials. They did the defined and the confirmed trials, and they were able to show benefits with reducing clinical attack rate by, by about 
So similar to what you see with uh, some of the other oral agents. They also showed slowing the rate of disability progression and showing the rate of new lesions on MRI scan somewhere in the uh, 80 to 90 percent range. So overall, uh, very beneficial in terms of its effect, both from the standpoint of clinical and MRI. From a safety and tolerability standpoint, there are a number of concerns gastrointestinal-wise that patients experience. So when they start the medication, you may have some abdominal pain, some nausea, maybe even some diarrhea. It tends to be somewhat transient. You can also get some flushing. What we've learned about the GI side effects is if you take the medication with food, it seems to reduce the concern for the gastrointestinal side effects. As far as the flushing goes, it can actually be quite annoying to patients because they will just feel like their skin is on fire. Um, but if they are having concerns about it, they can take a aspirin prior, which seems to be uh, able to control that. From a safety standpoint, the main concern that has come up is that currently there are six cases of PML that have been seen with this particular medication. And we believe that most of the cases seem to have lymphocyte counts that were below 800. And maybe even, you know, below five or 600 might be a significant risk. So what we've come up with as an idea to monitor these population of patients is that you should probably get blood work on them every three to six months monitoring their lymphocyte counts. And if they have persistent lymphopenia, probably you should take them off the medication because that might increase their risk to develop PML. We don't know that for sure, but at least the data from the cases that we have to date look like that is a good uh, risk assessment you can make uh, by, making, um, by getting their blood work. All right, so let's move on to natalizumab. So natalizumab is the first intravenous medication that got approved. It was approved in 2004. It was available for approximately three months and then pulled off the market because they found a couple of cases in PML in the clinical trials. So it was pulled off in 2005. It came back on the market in 2006. And overall, it is a very effective therapy. But because of the PML concern, there was a black box warning that was attached to this. And that now we have 780 cases of PML with this medication. So there's a concern, and I'll talk about that in a minute, about how we manage that concern. But as far as the medication goes, it's once a month intravenous, and it's very well tolerated. Patients may have um, a little bit of some infusion reactions, but overall pretty well tolerated. How it works, so there's molecules on your immune cells, and the, it's a monoclonal antibody that binds to this molecule that prevents them from migrating across the blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system. So ultimately, you can have a slight increase in your lymphocyte counts in the blood because they're not going to be able to adhere to the endothelial wall and migrate across. Uh, but the concern with this is that maybe you're going to cause immune suppression of the tissue because you can't get your lymphocytes into the tissues for surveillance. But it has a tremendous benefit with regards to its clinical efficacy in the treatment of MS. You look at the clinical data from the clinical trials, and this was able to show almost a 70% reduction in clinical attacks compared to placebo. So 42% reduction in disability progression, and the effects on MRI were in the 90% range in terms of preventing new lesions from occurring. So by far the most efficacious of the drugs that we had to date. Um, and, you know, it's really a phenomenal addition to the treatment for multiple sclerosis, but comes at a cost for safety. So the main issues are really uh, related to the PML, but I'll just highlight that there are infusion reactions that can occur. So patients may need to have some pre-medication if they are more likely to have a uh, infusion reaction. Another piece to this is that similar to what we've learned about um, Pigolamod is that if you stop the medication, you can have reactivation of disease and rebound. So something that you need to concern yourself with if you're going to come off the medication, and we'll need to put them onto something else fairly quickly. Now, in terms of the PML risk, so this has been a struggle for us in the MS community trying to figure out how best to manage this. We learned that if the medication is taken for more than two years, the risk of PML seems to go up. If they had a prior history of immunosuppressive treatments, 
And those treatments included medications like mycophenolate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, those kind of chemotherapy drugs. The risk went up an additional fourfold. And then more recently, we had developed a blood test for the JC virus um, antibody. And that blood test, the JC virus is the virus that causes PML. But the antibody to that test can be measured in the blood fairly easily. And it can give us a sense about risk. And what we've learned is that you can index or titer, so to speak, the uh, blood test results. And if they have a negative test, their risk is very low. And we say that their risk is probably less than one in 1,000 to develop PML. If their index levels being, you know, their positive blood test, but the index is greater than 1.5, we know that their risk in the first year is very low. But as you take the medication longer, the risk goes up significantly to the point where, you know, maybe the risk will be as high as, you know, one in 100 um, if you take the medication for many years. The question becomes, what about the people who have a low index? And we've been able to stratify these out as being less than 0.9 or greater than 1.5. So if they're less than 0.9, their risk is still fairly low. And they can continue to take the medication for many years with a very low risk. And that risk, we'd say, is probably no greater than 1 in 500 or maybe 1 in you know, 250. But if they have a history of prior immunosuppressive therapy, these rates go up dramatically. So remember that you, know, you don't want to keep somebody on this medication if they have a positive blood test um, for the JC virus antibody, taking the medication for more than two years with an index of greater than 1.5 and had previous immunosuppression. This is probably a group of people you want to take off the medication fairly quickly. Don't let them go more than two years. Now, that being said, what we don't know about this is that what do we do with the patients who've been on prior immune therapies, such as the drugs we use to treat MS, such as dimethylfumarate or fingolimod or teraflutamide? We don't know the answer to that at this point. And, you know, as time goes, maybe we'll learn about this. But this is a somewhat of a concern there. So I'm going to move on to alemtuzumab. Alemtuzumab is administered as an intravenous medication, but it's administered much less frequently. So there is a regimen where you give it for um, five consecutive days, and then you don't do anything for the rest of that year. And then the beginning of the second year, you give it for three days. And that's really all you need to do for this treatment because the effects are much longer living. And how it works, it binds to a molecule on your immune cells called the CD52 antigen, which is expressed on both B cells and T cells. And you have long-lasting depletion of T cells, which may be a year or so, maybe sometimes longer in some cases. And the B cells start to come back probably around three to six months. They start coming back, and they may even come back to a higher level than prior to treatment. And you don't have T cells around at that time to modulate their disease, you know, their, their activity, which may ultimately lead to one of the complications related to this treatment of secondary autoimmune phenomena. When you look at the results, very robust, and this was a head-to-head -head clinical trial with one of the high-frequency, high high-dose interferon products and showed, you know, very robust effects, 50-some-odd percent reduction. What's interesting, at least, is that this was not against placebo. This is against an active treatment that already has benefits. And you look at uh, the effect in two different clinical trials they did with the CARE-MS1 trial, which was patients who were naive to treatment, and you look at the patients who, in the care ms 2 trial, had been on a previous therapy and were failing that. And what you see is that you didn't really see a huge benefit um, between the two effective therapies in terms of disability progression, but you saw a significant benefit with regards to the reduction in clinical attacks. And that may be driven in part because neither group progressed very much because these are two effective therapies. But you look at the care ms 2 trial where you had breakthrough disease activity, there was also the same benefit with regards to its benefit in reduction in clinical attacks, but also showed a significant benefit in terms of disability progression here, 42%. Also showed benefits with regards to MRI activity quite robustly. So what are the concerns for this medication? So there are infusion reactions, so the patients need to have pre-medication. There are Infection concerns, so antiviral prophylaxis with uh, medications against BZV and HSV are appropriate, at least during the treatment cycles. The big concern for this medication is secondary autoimmunity. And what we've seen is that 
patients can develop autoimmune thyroid disease, and as high as maybe 50% of patients may develop autoimmune phenomena at some point. And it seems to be that it may not be within the first couple of years. It may be at years three and then beyond. Um, so that's a, somewhat of a concern, but that is a manageable concern. There's also ITP that has been seen in a small percentage of patients. And then rare cases of autoimmune uh, kidney disease, anticoagulant basement membrane disease, good pastures, things like that. So these are somewhat concerning. So when the FDA approved it, they needed a REMS program, and it requires patients to have blood work and a urinalysis done every month for at least four years after their last infusion. And the pharmaceutical company is very good about arranging to have that worked out for um, people to come out to the house or to their workplace to gather that blood work or urine and be able to give the results for the physician. There may be a slight increased risk for some malignancies as well, and that will be something that needs to be monitored in addition. So now I'm going to move on to the last of our intravenous medications, ocalizumab, which got approved about a year and a half ago. And this medication is administered every six months intravenously, and it targets your body's B cells. And so it's an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. And they've done clinical trials with both relapsing disease and in primary progressive disease. And in the relapsing disease, they did two clinical trials, and they compared it against a high-dose interferon administered subcutaneously as well. In the primary progressive trial, they compared it to placebo. And mechanistically, what we learned is that the medication binds to your body's B cells and depletes them. And depletes them for fairly long periods of time, we'll say somewhere close to six months, and that's why it's dosed every six months. And in the clinical trials, you look at the data for relapse rate reduction and MRI activity, and they were quite robust. You know, close to 50% reduction in clinical attacks compared to an active treated group with high-dose, high-frequency interferon. So again, this is not a placebo group. This is actually an active comparison. And they were able to show 40% reduction in disability progression, and the effects on MRI scan were awfully robust at 95% reduction in new lesions on MRI. So very impressive data in the relapsing cohort. In the primary progressive cohort, you saw a positive result of 24% reduction in disability progression at 12 weeks, 25% reduction at 24 weeks, which is really the first drug that we have to show a benefit in primary progressive patients to date. Very robust effects on MRI activity, uh, similar to what you've seen with um, the relapsing population. But what came out of the clinical trial in primary progressive MS is we know that primary progressive patients tend to be more progressive with less inflammation. They did a evaluation of patients who had GAN-enhancing lesions at entry into the study, and the, the effects were more robust in terms of slowing the rate of disability progression to the point of about 35% reduction in the population of patients who had GAN-enhancing lesions at, at entry, and a 16% reduction in patients who did not suggesting that it works in all the patients with primary progressive MS, but may work a little bit better in patients who have a little bit more evidence of inflammation on their MRI scan. When you look at the safety signals, main issues here came up as infusion reactions. 30 to 40% of the patients will have these infusion reactions. They're usually fairly um, easily managed by pre-medications, but people need to know about that. We didn't really see any signals infection-wise, uh, maybe a slight increased rate for upper respiratory infections or bladder infections, but nothing that really came out to be any major concerns. There were a few cases of malignancies in the clinical trials. We saw it in the older oratorio trial with primary progressive MS compared to the relapsing trials. But What's interesting about that is that there was a signal more overexpressed as breast cancer risk compared to other malignancies, which when they went back and looked at the clinical trial population and they tried to evaluate where those patients came from and what the risk of breast cancer was in those regions, there was no real increased signal for the patients getting breast cancer greater than the population from which they came. Now, that being said, 
we don't know enough about that. So the recommendation at this point is that patients should undergo appropriate breast cancer screening for age and stay on top of that so that we're not going to put people at risk. So there could be a signal here, but we don't know for sure. One thing to add about what we've learned about vaccinations for this medication is that because it depletes your body's B cells, there may be a reduction in the ability to mount a good immune response to a vaccination. So patients should get their vaccinations up to date prior to starting the medication. And then when you would dose them, if they need to get like a flu vaccine, you might benefit from waiting a little bit after the initial infusion and maybe do it toward the tail end of their infusions and give them about six weeks for that medication and, in, and immunization to take effect. So I'm gonna now touch base with you on a few of the agents that are currently in development. So the fingolimod treatment binds to this sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor. And because it binds to many of the receptors and there are many different parts of the body, the concern is whether the medication could be more selective if you could come up with receptors that did not have as much expression in various tissues. So there are several agents that are in development right now. Ozanamod is one. It's a more selective uh, treatment that binds to the S1P1 and 5 receptors. And they, would, they did clinical trials and it showed very nice effects in terms of reducing clinical attacks um, and MRI activity and seem to have maybe a reduction in the cardiovascular issue. So ultimately, you want to see if you can find medications that would not require patients to undergo first-dose monitoring and the concerns cardiac-wise. So this is currently um, under evaluation and has been evaluated in several clinical trials, and they look good. Um, they will be submitting again to the FDA for an approval in the near future. So because we are looking for more selective treated uh, receptors, here is a medication, saponamod, which is also more selective at the S1P1 and 5 receptors. And they did clinical trials in secondary progressive MS called the EXPAND trial. And this is really the first clinical trial to show a benefit in patients with secondary progressive MS. Showed a 21% reduction in disability progression and had very robust effects in MRI and in patients who still had clinical relapses. So we hope that this will get an approval in the next six months. It's currently sitting at the FDA, and this could be the first medication we have available for the treatment of secondary progressive MS. There's another medication called Panisamod, which is also in clinical development, and that's being looked at right now, also more selective, but it's being looked at as a combination therapy uh, in patients with um, dimethylfumarate. So another medication that's currently in development is called cladribine. This medication works um, by inhibiting DNA synthesis and may lead to some apoptosis. So this is a medication that also is a little bit more of a depleter and has, seems to have a more selective effect um, on T lymphocytes, transient effect on B lymphocytes, but is also administered in a very infrequent basis. So this one is given over five days in two successive months. And the frequency of this is, is several, uh, several courses over the course of the two years. They were able to show very nice robust effects in disability progression as well as clinical attack rates and MRI activity. So this is something that's currently at the FDA and it may hopefully get an approval in the near future. It's currently approved in many countries throughout the planet, including Europe and Canada. Another medication that's currently in development is a medication that's similar to the dimethylfumarate. It's administered twice daily, and it gets converted over to monomethylfumarate, which is similar to what you see with dimethylfumarate. There are a couple of clinical trials ongoing, and we should have some preliminary data in the near future, but the idea here is that maybe you would have a little improved GI side effect profile compared to dimethylfumarate. And just to conclude with a few other agents that are in development that are potentially exciting include medication biotin. Biotin has been used to treat patients with hair and nail concerns. Um, this is administered at a much higher dose at 300 milligrams a day. There have been some data to suggest that it was helpful in the progressive population, so there's ongoing clinical trials with this. Other ones to mention briefly include ofatumumab, which is another anti-CD20 treatment, which is a subcutaneous administration as opposed to intravenous medication and a different dosing scheme. 
So that's currently in a phase three clinical trial. There's opacinumab, which is one of the first drugs that are looking at the possibility of remyelination. Um, so that's also in development. So I'm going to move on to how we look at defining treatment failure. Because now you have your patient on, on treatment and you're monitoring them and, you know, maybe there's some breakthrough disease activities. So we have to make a determination how we're going to monitor them. And when do you make a switch in therapy? So we generally like to say you put them on treatment and you monitor them and you get a repeat MRI scan in three to six months to establish a new baseline. And the reason for that is that you can have disease activity that can occur before the medication has really had its full benefit. Now, we also need to know that patients may not be able to be 100% free of disease activity. These medications are not 100% effective. So we have to have a proper understanding, but you want to be able to think, well, what is my tolerance for disease activity? We generally would say anybody who has any clinical attacks, having more than one or two MRI lesions, and anybody whose disability progression is evolving, are all potential candidates for a change in treatment. So we have to think that through. But so the way we think about it is when you have somebody who's on a therapy, you go ahead and you say, well, when does this therapy become effective? Any activity before that time point, you'll have to make a determination if you want to stick with the treatment or, or choose an alternative. But I generally like to think of it as a three-month time window where they're getting on the therapy and the therapy is going to have its effects. But anything after that point, and we re-baseline them at a three- to six-month time point, is going to be enough of a concern to me to look at, do I need to change their therapy? And what you ultimately come up with is relapse metrics, MRI metrics, and progression metrics. And there's a model, this Canadian treatment optimization model, that can kind of give us a guide as to whether or not we need to be concerned or not. You know, and I mentioned that, you know, one or two little lesions on an MRI scan may not be enough for an absolute switch, at least we have it to date. Maybe that'll change in the future. But anybody who has any significant clinical relapses, and that may be, you know, a motor or a cerebellar attack or significant loss of function that does not recover, that may be enough to make a change because you know that a subsequent attack could lead to significant disability. And when we think about the notion of switching to a different medication, you want to say to yourself, all right, so I'm going to make a change, but you can consider a different mechanism of action, but you also want to look at, you know, like you don't want to go across in a lateral switch in efficacy. If somebody's breaking through on a disease modifying therapy, you want to come up with a different mechanism of action and something more robust, something that's going to control the disease better. And at least to date, we know the infusible medications and maybe even fingolimod are all a notch up in terms of efficacy. So we generally would say, you know, if you're on a medication that's an injectable or an oral medication that's inadequate, you should go up into the next arena of efficacy. And yes, we have to then take on a different risk profile and different safety monitoring. And, you know, we may get to a medication like alentuzumab. We may say, well, for a drug like that, maybe you should even consider a couple of treatments uh, failed prior to going to that medication. Although I'm going to tell you that I think the field has been moving more and more into the idea of getting some of these more aggressive therapies much earlier than we had previously. Now, you could ask the question, are there patients who might be able to stop therapy completely? When do you need um, to say you've been doing well, you've had no new problems, maybe we could take you off this therapy? So right now we have no data, but there is a clinical trial trying to address this question and ask the question, should patients at some point come off therapy? And the way the trial is designed at this point is called the DISCO-MS trial, or discontinuation trial, is that if they're over 55 and have been stable without any clinical attacks or any clinical or any MRI activity, you might be able to randomly assign them to come off the medication and see how they do. And so it's basically going to be 50% stay on the treatment, 50% come off the treatment, and then we'll determine after a couple of years whether they needed to be on therapy or not. We'll see. So to conclude, we really like to consider what does the disease look like? What is the patient's concerns? And which drug do we want to put them on and have that be a shared decision-making conversation? We have to address the risk factors of what we believe are risky um, Behaviors, cigarette smoking, high salt diet, these are things that we know could be problematic. Um, you know, maybe diet plays a role here. We don't know for sure. But these are things 
that we have to we can control, but then making sure other modifiable risk factors such as dealing with their high blood pressure and diabetes are all things to consider, and patients need to be on top of that as well. Adhere to the medication, make sure patients are bought into the idea of what to expect from the treatment and adequately educate them and have them understand the risk of the disease and the benefit of the treatments. And we have to monitor them closely and make adjustments based on tolerability and efficacy. This concludes my portion of the presentation. I will now turn the presentation back over to Dr. Cannon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. Let's now move on and let's talk about formulary management and access. I like this slide. I like the way it breaks it down into the clinical, the economics, and the patient. We always try and account for the efficacy of products and the safety of products first. Uh, we probably got the patient in the wrong place on this slide. The patient ought to definitely be taken into account early on in this process. We want to find treatments that they can adhere to and administratively fit within their lifestyle. Uh, we want to take the economics into account. Uh, so what are the treatment costs and what would be appropriate utilization? All of these things come together to help us appropriately manage a formulary. So as we look at the evidence that's available uh, for formulary decisions, one of the challenges that we face and very clearly uh, in this category is the rapid pace of innovation. You look at the number of products that have come out into the market recently in the last several years for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. How do we keep up with that pace of innovation and how do we incorporate variable definitions of evidence uh, that came out with those products? Uh, if we look at the opportunities, there's real opportunity for us to engage the stakeholders. And if I look at our organization, that's one of the things that we're really focused on is how do we bring everyone together so that we can look at the available data and then how do we develop an approach that informs the treatment of the patients that we have. Let's take a look now at the 2018 guidelines and, and updated recommendations. All of these being things that I would think make sense to all of us. We need patient engagement strategies. We need to be able to individualize treatment for our patients. We should be focused on monitoring of adherence, but also looking at disease comorbidities that may exist within our particular patients. Uh, it's clear when we should start uh, treatment. We know in patients with highly active disease, we now have three or four therapies that ought to be prescribed. Uh, when we see breakthrough disease, we need to look at switching, uh, and then we need to be, make sure that we're counseling our patients on the risks that are associated with disease-modifying therapy. Based on the guidelines, we know that adherence to disease-modifying therapies improves outcomes and improves quality of life for our patients. There's many factors that impact adherence. Uh, dosage form, so is it injectable or oral, uh, the tolerability, the efficacy of the product, uh, costs, what a particular patient's insurance may be, do they need preauthorization, do they have a particularly high coinsurance. If we look at strategies for ad improving adherence, we know that if we can address an individual patient's depression before initiating therapy, that their adherence is improved. We know that the more we educate the patient and then include the patient in that shared decision-making process, uh, patients understand their disease state better and are more willing to be adherent to therapy. We also, and it's critical that we involve our specialty pharmacies and we monitor uh, for side effects and, and we treat adverse events and, and also reach out to patients in, 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 at points of non-adherence. All right, let's take a look at some managed care recommendations for optimizing care. We know we need to develop action plans that balance appropriate access uh, to optimal therapies and also help manage the high cost of disease-modifying therapies. We need to use the evidence-based guideline recommendations that we have to individualize therapy for our patients. We know that healthcare providers and payers need to be working together in, in assessing what the new and emerging treatments are. We know that each one of our patients is not going to be the same. How do we find those treatments that work best for each one of our patients? As payers, we need to take into account uh, the impact of some of our actions and coverage policies, and how do we allow to have policies create an environment in which we can individualize treatment. We know there are variations in disease, and we need to take into account those patient preferences and the other patient factors as we create optimal strategies to manage the disease states of our patients. So in conclusion, uh, managed care formularies need multiple options that can be individualized for patients. We know with the current therapies, we have multiple options for treatment, and Dr. Markowitz has done a great job in reviewing those treatments for us today. 
as we go about administering care, we need to be patient-centric. We need to individualize that treatment so that each patient receives optimal outcomes. And in the end, if we talk about improving adherence, we know that as we involve patients in, in shared decision-making, uh, adherence improves. That concludes the presentation. Thank, thank you very much for attending this webinar. And welcome to a Q&A session. I'm Dr. Eric Cannon. I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Markowitz, uh, who uh, presented our, our clinical section. I think, Dr. Markowitz, thank you for uh, your clinical presentation. I think uh, from a managed care standpoint, understanding uh, really the clinical intricacies and, and details behind the treatments is, is very helpful as we develop formularies. Is there a point where relapsing remitting therapy is recommended to be stopped? And, and that's in a case where the disease has progressed to secondary progressive. So is there a point when treating relapsing remitting where you would consider stopping therapy? So to date, we have um, very little information that says that after a patient, well, let's just say this. We know that the disease continues to be inflammatory in the progressive phase of the disease. So if somebody starts out relapsing and then they move into a secondary progressive phase, they may still continue to have both clinical relapses or evidence on MRI scan of new inflammation. We know from every clinical trial that's been done in secondary progressive disease that it has a benefit in terms of reducing attacks in the people who are still having attacks, and it clearly had benefits in patients who were having ongoing inflammatory activity on their MRI. So just because somebody moves into secondary progressive disease is not a reason to stop their therapy because we know that there's still ongoing inflammation where this drug could be beneficial. And now we have data that completed a clinical trial with one of the targets similar to fingolimod, but it's called sepanamod, which has been shown to have a benefit in slowing the rate of progression in patients who have secondary progressive disease. So clearly a benefit in terms of slowing the progression, and here's the first compound that potentially might get an approval. So we're very excited about that. So no, we shouldn't stop therapy, but you could ask a question if somebody is elderly, you know, maybe in their 60s or 70s, and they haven't had any sort of disease activity and they're taking these drugs, you know, could we stop? Well, the question is being answered by a clinical trial, and it's ongoing right now, and there's, uh, you know, we're rolling people into the idea of randomly assigning people to either continue therapy or stop and see how they do over the next couple of years. I can tell you, honestly, I still see people who show evidence of inflammatory activity, both clinically and radiologically, of people in their 60s and 70s. In fact, I just diagnosed somebody in their 70s for the first time uh, two weeks ago. So age does not play a, a factor there, and the amount of disability may or may not play, but I think it's important to realize that we're trying to answer those questions. Great. No, thank you. you know, what white blood cell count result level would you consider stopping fingolamide to prevent possible infections? That's a great question. So here's what we know. We know that the white blood cell counts in the peripheral blood are a function of how the drug works. And we also know that the drug is not depleting lymphocytes from the lymph nodes or from um, secondary organs. So you can still fight infections without any difficulty. Now, that being said, in the clinical trials, they did not see any correlation between the white blood cell counts and a risk of infection. But there was a cutoff of 200 for the lymphocytes that if somebody dropped below that, they would stop the medication, retest their blood work in about a week or so, and then restart it. And that's kind of how we deal with it in practice. But I can tell you that I have some people who are chronically fairly low, and I don't necessarily stop their treatment. I just keep an eye on it. Um, but there isn't a great correlation between that number in the peripheral blood because that's just kind of how the drug works. But, you know, there is a concern for PML, and there's a concern for cryptococcal infections, which make it somewhat concerning. But even with that, there is not a good correlation with lymphocyte counts. So there must be something else to the medication that puts people at risk, and we wonder whether or not immunosenescence, immunosenescence plays a role in that in older patients whose immune systems may not be as robust in their ability to function, but not necessarily driven by a count number. 
Thank you. The other the other question that's come through is, is can you clarify which disease modifying therapies are immunomodulators versus immunosuppressant? Well, so that definition is somewhat vague because, you know, historically we'd say immunosuppressants were drugs that caused increased risk of infections and increased risk of cancers. And that's kind of two main arms of the immune system and how, how the immune system functions. Now, you look at the injectable drugs, we never saw any major increased risk for infection or um, malignancy, so we called those immune modulators because they modulate immune responses but don't suppress the ability for the immune system to fight infections or survey the tumors. When the oral medications came out, there was a question about whether or not these were more immunosuppressive treatments, whether or not, you know, dropping your white blood cell counts was going to be a immunosuppressant the way chemotherapy drugs are. But since fingolimod has a unique mechanism, it doesn't fit into the same category as an immune suppressant as what we talk about for chemotherapies. So, you know, it does have an increased risk for uh, opportunistic infections with, you know, some cases of PML and some cases of cryptococcal meningitis. Haven't seen malignancies to be a huge problem, although you have seen an increased risk for certain skin cancers. So there's been a debate about where that medication fits in. And then you look at teraflutamide, which also has some um, immunosuppressive capabilities. Again, questions about whether it should fit in one or the other. And even um, dimethyl fumarate has some concerns, given that there are some cases of PML um, associated with that drug. So the orals would fit more into a distribution of um, somewhere between immunosuppression and immunomodulatory. And then when you get into the intravenous medications, I think most of us would say they have immunosuppressive capabilities because of the risks of infections or maybe malignancies, et cetera. So I think those tend to be at least labeled more as immunosuppressive, but I'm not really convinced that that's wholeheartedly true. Great. Thank you. We uh, appreciate those answers. Uh, this concludes our question and answer period. Uh, please make sure to complete the post-test and evaluation on the program page that you will be redirected to in a moment uh, to claim your credit for continuing education. Uh, thanks for joining us.